Whether you're a fan of the historical and political CLS, the gaming-centric side quest, or the podcast series Fireside Chats, or some combination of the three, I hope you'll consider supporting Colin's Last Stand on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Doing so allows all three shows to continue without baked-in ads and other obnoxious forms of advertising. You also get a bunch of cool perks depending on your level of support, like the ability to vote on upcoming video topics, early access to podcasts, Patreon-exclusive Q&A videos, and more. Thank you for your kindness and support. Now, on to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Colin's Last Stand side quest right here on YouTube. My name is Colin Moriarty. As always, I hope today's video finds you and yours very well. And I realize that I left my hockey stick in the shot. I'm very sorry about that. Very unprofessional. Very sorry about that. Today, I'm finally going to tell you a story that I've been wanting to tell you for the better part of five years. This happened to me back in 2013 when I was still senior editor at IGN. And it's something that I've not told you about because I want to respect my old site and all of that. But Time has passed and I've gotten kind of all my ducks in a row and, and crossed the T's and dotted the I's and I can finally tell you this story. And it involves IGN, Konami, and me. And a few other characters as well that I'm going to tell you about. And basically how Konami blacklisted IGN for a period of time and no one knows about this story until now. But I'm going to tell it to you. So I hope you enjoy it. I know you guys like your inside baseball and your behind the scenes stuff. Well, this is about as inside baseball and behind the scenes as it's going to get, especially coming out of games media. So... Uh, enjoy. I'll see you on the other side. To tell the story of Konami's blacklisting of IGN and of me, we need to go back to Gamescom in 2013. Gamescom, like E3 or Tokyo Game Show or PSX or any number of big game expos, is, from an editorial standpoint, all about proper planning and then executing on that plan. And because of how important these shows are to outlets' respective readerships, it's essential that everything is done right. Who will go see what games? Who will tend to which appointments? When will editors have the time to create content? It's a Google Docs slash personal dance slash hell built up sometimes over months with endless meetings and phone calls and emails with publishers and developers just to get it right. And at IGN, we almost always got it right. We always paired up the people who made sense with the games they could speak best to, the editors and talent that could conduct the best interviews, solidly execute demos, and on and on. So on my schedule for Gamescom in 2013 was a meeting with Konami to see Castlevania Lords of Shadow 2 in a behind closed door session. This made perfect sense for IGN and therefore for our readers. I was IGN's biggest Castlevania fan and expert by a mile. I'm the guy that should see this game. But Konami disagreed and it's there that the fiasco, a fiasco IGN never encountered before or after, begins. I remember it like it was yesterday. With my laptop bag over my shoulder and my notebook in hand, I approached the PR counter at the booth to report for my appointment, timely as always. A woman behind the desk asked me to write my name and outlet on a piece of paper, which she then sent behind the scenes. Moments later, out emerged a man named Brian Ayers, who, during this time, was the PR and marketing manager for Konami working out of the UK. I approached Ayers and shook his hand, expecting to be taken into a nearby room to begin our appointment in earnest. Ayers, who I had never met before or since, immediately had an attitude with me. He told me that Mercury Steam refused to see me or anyone from IGN US due to, quote, unfair treatment, end quote, of Lords of Shadow going back, quote, many years, end quote. Interestingly, Mercury Steam and Konami, according to Ayers, only wanted to see people from IGN UK, our satellite office out of London, for treatment he termed fair. During our five-minute conversation, Ayers, at one point, at my request, went back behind the scenes to see if he could find Jay Bohr, Konami's head of communications, and someone I actually know, but Bohr refused to come out. The die was essentially cast. Konami openly and brazenly blocked IGN from seeing its game over a petty grudge I wasn't fully aware of yet, but would become very aware of later, and Mr. Ayers and I went our separate ways. In reality, and unknown to me at the time, was that this story actually went back three years before this event, back to the launch of the original Castlevania Lords of Shadow, and that I was, in essence, the sacrificial lamb in a deeply unprofessional, one-sided feud Konami had with my outlet. It's at this point that we have to introduce perhaps the most central character to this entire ordeal, a man named Dave Cox. Cox worked at Konami for 15 years, rising to the studio head and producer of Konami Digital Entertainment, working out of the UK, and it turns out that it was really him, not Ayers or Bohr, that was at the nexus of this nonsense. As the Konami-employed producer of the Lords of Shadow series being created by a studio Konami didn't own, Cox apparently looked at his games as something he needs to protect at all costs. In late September of 2010, right before the original Lords of Shadow was set for launch, my old friend Damon Hatfield, himself a devoted Castlevania fan and one of the most knowledgeable gamers I've ever known, had the audacity to call Lords of Shadow good. 
He gave it a 7.5. Now at this time, IGN was often giving multiple reviews for games based on territory. IGN US would issue a review, IGN UK would, and IGN Australia would too. IGN UK happened to give Lords of Shadow a full point higher, 8.5, which actually falls in line perfectly with the game's Metacritic score. Cox and Konami grappled onto this as a sign of systemic bias, and they wouldn't let go. Hence my failed appointment at Gamescom three years later. It also gave Konami a way to try and play both sides against the middle. IGN UK was the good child, IGN US was the bad child, and the bad child, according to Konami, was going to go to bed hungry from here on out if they had anything to do with it. Even after IGN folded its review system into a single review speaking for all English-speaking sites, Konami's behavior persisted. Cox tweeted out disparaging remarks about IGN following the original review, and although I cannot find the tweets, which I believe have been deleted, a source did share the text of them with me. At one point, he said, quote, I got no problem with low reviews. A review is, after all, someone's opinion, but that is not a review of our game from IGN, end quote. At another point, he said, quote, I would look at all of the reviews, good and bad, and read the actual content of what they all had to say. Disregard the IGN one, end quote. Later, he said, quote, I don't have a problem with GameSpot. The reviewer at least played the game, end quote. Another one noted that it was, quote, nice to see people seeing the IGN review for what it was, end quote. We at IGN let it go, though. Professionalism on our end ruled the day. We stood by our review of Lords of Shadow, and although I would have actually given it a higher score than 7.5 myself, this reaction was over someone calling a game good. Good. The reality is IGN's scores are an endorsement of a viewpoint we all trust. Few of us agreed with each other on scores. We simply agreed that we had the right to our individual perspectives. Konami gave us no such respect, however. If you fast forward to 2012, though, a year before what happened to me at Gamescom, the ugliness starts to rear its head again, this time moving into E3. We attempted to schedule a meeting with Konami to see Lords of Shadow sequel, Lords of Shadow 2. In late May and into June of that year, we actually had an appointment with Konami on the books, which Konami, closer to the show, canceled on us with no actual explanation. Our management did everything possible, including proposing new times and even new venues to meet, but Konami wasn't interested. It was clear they were still harboring a grudge about our 7.5 for Lords of Shadow, now two years after the fact. Things seemed to soften, however. Lords of Shadow was going to get a 3DS-exclusive Metroidvania-style game in early 2013, also out of Mercury Steam, that we were allowed to cover early the next year, well before release and outside of game expos. But when the game finally came out and it ended up being bad, and when I had the nerve to call it as such, everything erupted anew and further puts what happened at Gamescom later that year into focus. I gave the 3DS game, Mirror of Fate, a 4.7, well below its Metacritic score, but not the lowest score it received from a respected outlet. Many disagreed with the score, including Konami and Mercury Steam, and that is their right. Every critic falls outside of the mainstream on occasion, and this was one of those instances for me. For what it's worth, I still stand by the review, but even then, and unbeknownst to me, our hole with Konami was getting dug deeper. I was ignorant of this for two reasons. My bosses were taking care of it at the top, and beyond that, I had never ever experienced this kind of treatment with another publisher or developer, good coverage given or bad coverage given. It's just not even remotely the norm. Our editors-in-chief over time have had discussions explaining our review scores to PR. I've been taken to task once or twice behind the scenes for a review or a take on a podcast or a preview that someone somewhere took umbrage with in the chain of command at a studio or a publisher, but that never ever materialized in feeling so hurt that coverage would thereafter be limited. Until now. Fast forward a few months from there and it's almost time for E3 2013. Things had been quiet for a while ever since Konami lodged complaints with my bosses about their Mirror of Fate review by making up a story that the staff of IGN UK requested to review Mirror of Fate and was turned down, something that never actually happened. By May of 2013, Judges Week at E3, when a select few people from the biggest and best gaming outlets get an early look at E3 builds and reveals, rolled around, as it does each year. Dave Cox actively lobbied Konami to ban IGN from Judges Week access outright, which didn't work. But Cox and Konami did attempt to block any post-demo interviews after playing the game, which required a phone meeting to be scheduled between the powers that be at IGN, Konami PR, and Dave Cox. Cox didn't show up for the call. When Cox and IGN's editor-in-chief at the time encountered each other at Judges Week, Cox said to him, quote, IGN's last two reviews were unprofessional and factually inaccurate, end quote. REIC offered to hear Cox out further and tried to plan a meeting with him, to which Cox said, quote, I have nothing to say to you, end quote. For a time after E3, Konami refused to speak to or meet with any of IGN's higher-ups about the issue. That brings us to Gamescom 2013, when Konami, for the first time in my own experience and for the first time in IGN history, refused to let the outlets see their game, a game, if you're curious, I was actually very excited about. My bosses at IGN congratulated me for staying cool in the moment and representing IGN with class, and attempted to schedule a meeting with Jay Bohr, the aforementioned big shot at Konami. 
Konami's focus on pitting IGN US versus IGN UK and only attempting to show games or expecting reviews from IGN UK wasn't going to fly with any of us. It wasn't flying in the American office, it wasn't flying in the UK office, and it sure as hell wasn't going to fly with our readership. For the time being, we decided to remain quiet, deal with this as professionally as we could, and do right by our readers, which is all we really cared about. We would continue to cover Konami's announcements through third parties if necessary, and buy games at retail also if necessary in order to review them. But when we as an outlet told Konami that we'd have to tell our readers what was going on so they knew why coverage was missing, Konami agreed to meet IGN at our San Francisco headquarters on October 17th, 2013. On October 16, the day before the meeting, Konami canceled on us. When Konami attempted to reschedule with us and offered to bring the game by for a demo, we agreed and told them I'd be covering the game. Once word got back to Cox about who was taking the demo, he canceled the meeting again, this time citing a scheduling conflict. In December of 2013, however, Konami PR and Dave Cox finally did come to IGN's office to show the game. Everyone was cordial, and I loved what I saw of the game. It seemed like water under the bridge. Whether it truly was or not is unknown to me. I never dealt with Konami ever again in my entire career following Lords of Shadow 2's launch in 2014. But I did review Lords of Shadow 2 when it launched. I gave it a 6.5, a fifth of a point above its Metacritic score. And so the strange, sad saga between Konami, IGN, and Colin Moriarty concluded, but not before lots of respect was lost. IGN was allowed full access to Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes and Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain, and no issues whatsoever were caused behind the scenes for either title, indicating yet again that Konami's issues with IGN were actually Dave Cox's issues with IGN, manifested for all of us to witness behind the scenes. The question still remains, though. How could such unprofessional, out-of-line behavior from a publisher towards an outlet be allowed to persist for so long? The good news, though, is that Konami's behavior is the outlier of outliers and paints a picture not of the industry norm, but of a flailing publisher upset that it isn't getting its way. Oh, and Konami, Mercury Steam, and Dave Cox didn't respond to requests for comment in time for publish. All right, well, that's it for me today on Colin's Last Stand SideQuest. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I certainly enjoyed telling you this story, and I hope that you found it riveting or at least somewhat interesting. I know a lot of you don't get behind the scenes access and behind the scenes views of what goes on in the gaming industry. Well, there you go. That's a pretty behind the scenes look at one thing that happened to us a long time ago. Water under the bridge, as I said, but still a story that I felt like I needed to get out there, especially considering what happened with Konami later with Hideo Kojima and Metal Gear and kind of the collapse of the publisher and how I had a story to tell that contributed to that whole kind of arc, but I was never able to tell it until now. Leave your comments below. Let me know what you think. Thumb up the video if you liked it. Thumb it down if you don't. Please join us on Patreon if you can. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Share the videos with friends and family. Let them know about the might, the magic, and the wonder of Colin's Last Stand SideQuest. I will waste no more of your time. I appreciate what time you have given me, and I will see you next time for more SideQuest. Keep on gaming.